empty the chamber on them. And how do you do that? Four, six seconds, point eight, point feet, everything you got. Everything you got. Turn that shit up. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome to the Scoop World Order. We are live. Uh, this is show two of the day. We're getting cranked up. We have Bill the Bank Green joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about the recruiting portal. We're going to talk about Ohio State recruiting the state of Ohio, which is a hot topic right now. Uh, how early is it that you should be offering some of these kids? Uh, some of these kids are, you know, they're committing early. They're going to Michigan. They're going elsewhere. We're going to get Banks' take on that. Uh, he was down in sunny South Florida and got to enjoy uh, some great seven on seven football. Uh, which is always a wild and crazy scene, and nobody knows the grounds of 7-on-7 seven seven like the bank does. So we're going to get some takes on that, and uh, we're going to take your questions. So we appreciate you guys being here, as always. We are always thankful for you guys. You guys have a lot of things you can check out at night, and you guys tuning in with us, we really appreciate it. We have a blast during the show. Uh, we're on BuckeyeScoop.com pretty much 24 hours a day, so it was a blast. Uh, the scoop never sleeps, football never sleeps, Ohio State recruiting and roster changes never sleep. So it is crazy. So you should join BuckeyeScoop.com because it is a blast. And I swear every hour there's some breaking story that we have to get to. And I am going to get to my man, Bill the Bank Green. Bank, how are you tonight? Good, man. Doing great. So uh, obviously we got to get to the Florida stuff because, you know, you were down in in the trenches of seven on seven football. Um, kind of set the scene for people that have never been to a seven on seven tournament. They don't really know what seven on seven is. Obviously, it's outlawed in Ohio like it's some sort of illegal drug, which is crazy. But yeah. down there, it is an entire livelihood, lifeblood. I love it because I think that these kids, you know, there ain't no hiding. It's like you said, like there's no... You're out there in front of everybody. There's no safety help. You're one on one, and who gets to eat and who gets who gets eaten is always interesting. But talk a little bit about the seven on seven uh, tournament that you went to this past weekend. Yeah, it was a battle seven on seven. Uh, the team that won it was from Arizona. There was a team uh, team from Texas, team from California, team from Michigan, um, a ton of teams from Florida. I mean, it's a huge event. You know what I mean? When you get a, a group of kids coming from Arizona, California, Michigan, you know, it's gigantic. Um, it's a shame and a crime that Ohio doesn't allow it. You can't have seven on seven in Ohio, but it's got to be as a team event. You know, St. Ed's can have a seven on seven with Maslin Perry, but you can't, it can't be like AAU basketball, which is really what seven on seven football is. Mm -hmm. Um you know, the team we know best is the South Florida Express out of Miami, Brett Getz's group with Ricky Williams and those guys, Geno Smith. You know, they have a group of all-stars, you know what I mean? And um, those kids will play together. They, they select a team in December, and seven-on-seven seven football will go all the way into May, so almost every weekend. They go to, you know, they're at tournaments all over the place. They're in Vegas. They go to California. They're, it's crazy, you know, but it, it – really is a huge help to these kids to make them better. And the kids that are playing seven on seven are not necessarily kids that are looking to get offered that are under the radar kids. You know, last weekend, I mean, it was KJ Bolden, JJ Smith, Jojo Trader. Yeah. I mean, just on and on and on, you know, best kids in the country are, are there at this event. So they do it to get better because they love it. You know, when you have kids there that are ranked in the top 50 in America, they're not doing this for their ranking. You know, they love competing, and, and it is a chance to get better. You know what I mean? So um, I love 7-on-7. Seven seven. I definitely wish Ohio would get involved in this. And, <clears throat> you know, I know some of the reasons why they don't want to. They don't want these kids, um, you know, being taken away from basketball and wrestling and stuff like that. But you know, it is what it is, man. And it, it helps make kids better, you know, and Ohio is absolutely falling behind in terms of producing the top end talent and even the middle talent, and the low end talent, you know, the state of Ohio is certainly not what it used to be in terms of producing division one talent, as we were talking about, you know, before the show started, the numbers in Ohio are staggering right now. The number of kids that signed division one offers are half of what it used to be during the heyday of the state. Now, is seven on seven a cure for that? No, but it's a help. 
is spring football a cure for that? No, but it's a help, you know. Um, so I love seven on seven and, um, it's a great way to identify quarterbacks, wide receivers and DBs. I couldn't agree more. Again, I think it's a crime against humanity that we don't have seven on seven football, because I think that, you know, the, the, the funny thing to me is there's so many arguments against seven on seven that are, Oh, it'll take you from basketball. It'll take you from baseball, but you just see so much specialization nowadays, you know, cause right. baseball doesn't care. You know, baseball, it goes all summer. Uh, the, you know, it's obviously it's a spring sport in high school, but those kids are gone all summer. Oh, yeah. Like, so, and they don't care about, Oh, you're going to miss your football conditioning or your football workouts. Cause you've got, you know, a tournament for four days in Georgia or a tournament in Kentucky or whatever. And, and basketball, AU basketball goes all summer too. So, you know, yeah. I, I think it's a weak argument because I think that, you know, if kids really want to be the best, you need as much skill development as possible. And I think that, you know, the, the, the biggest benefit to me about seven on seven, man, is like, you got to go get after guys that are like as good as you. Like, I mean, if you're playing, you know, at Lakewood St. Ed's or, so, or whatever, and you're playing a seven on seven against Maslin Perry, like you're not going to see, uh, you're not going to be a cornerback that's going against Brandon Innes or 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 JoJo Trader or JJ Smith, but you go to these seven on seven tournaments, you gotta check JJ Smith. Like, you know, you're not in high school, there's just too much, you know, where you are is where you are. And and you know, like in 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 and the hardest part to me about evaluating like an offensive lineman, for instance, is that if you're watching Taylor Decker, for instance, when he's at Vandalia Butler, he doesn't play against like all Big Ten defensive ends. He's throwing around like little kids on the ground and well, is he good or is he just good because he's going against weak competition? But seven on seven, man, you get the cream of the cream. You get best on best and you get down to the nitty gritty of that tournament, man. And you're seeing dudes versus dudes. And for a guy like you that loves to get a good, firm evaluation, how beneficial is it to you to, to see dudes versus dudes at an event like that? Oh, it's huge because like you say, it's easy to watch J.J. Smith run routes in a 75 to 10 game, you know, where they have no chance, but in seven on seven, if I see a DB that can hang with JJ Smith, then I know that <laughs> he, needs be, he needs to be recruited by someone. You know what I mean? He's, and, and you know, when I see KJ Bolden, um, yeah, I know KJ Bolden can tackle. I've watched him on film. I don't know who he can cover or if he can cover from watching his high school film. When I watch him try to cover JoJo or JJ Smith, and I watch KJ Bolton cover people this weekend, I mean, to me, I mean, that just, I always liked him anyway, and I thought he might be the best DB in the country. But when I saw him in person last weekend, it just reaffirmed everything that I thought I was seeing on tape um, the size, the speed, the hip turn, um, ball skills. You see it all there because you're out there naked. Yep. I mean, and if you get abused, you get abused. And that's the way it is. I mean, Cormani McLean was probably the number one DB in the country last year. Um, and he has a chance to be an NFL all pro. But he's not ready for that right now. Okay. He's going to get coached by Deion Sanders every day. And he needs that. So Cormani was ranked basically on his potential, which is out the roof. He's six foot three. He's got arms that stretch across the field he can run he can his potential is amazing but in seven on seven he, he got he got beat up a lot last year in seven on seven to where brandon innes and those guys are yelling get him off the field you know so now i still like cormani and i would still take cormani that's not to indict him as a fraud or i'm not saying that no. um but his best football is three years that two or three years away it's not today Okay, so if you're recruiting Cormani, you got to know you're going to put a lot of time in on him. He is not ready to go right now. So I hope, you know, when I look at Cormani, who's a great kid going to Colorado, I hope they don't start him as a true freshman and he's got to cover the USC wide outs. He's not ready for that right now. Okay, and I hope Dion can see that and know that if you put a year into him, man, the payoff on the back end could be just gigantic. But if you put him out there too early and he loses all confidence and he gets destroyed and man, you, that kid could be ruined. He is nowhere near close to a finished product. 
And that was kind of what seven on seven showed about Cormani, but people still ranked him highly because of all his skills. Not ready to play today. Will could be an all American in two or three years though. So, but seven on seven exposes all that. I mean, there's just nowhere to hide. And it's the same thing that we see at the Ohio state camp. You know, it's not 11 on 11 there. It's seven on seven. It's, you know, and a lot of wide receiver against DB drills, one-on-one stuff. Yeah. But that's what Ryan Day is looking to see when he holds his camp. That's what he's looking to see. Oh, I see. I And I think even when you go down to these these events in South Florida like you went to, like you're seeing, you're probably seeing more good on good just because of the region where it's located is closer to get to than Ohio State's camp. Because I feel like the talent – has gone down at Ohio State's camp over the – maybe last year it was down a little bit from two years ago when we went and saw, you know, Shamar and Nico. And like, you know, we had, there were some ballers that were there two years ago. Last year it was a little drier. Um, but I, I just – I love 7-on-7 seven seven because a guy like Brandon Ennis will call a guy like Cromani, who's got five stars, who's number one corner in the country, call him out. Because if you, if you don't want to show up to work that day, you're going to get worked. And, yeah. you know, if, if, yeah. if, if Dijon's a baller – because you talked about Dijon, you know, who was committed to Ohio State at the time, and and they said, hey, these kids, they, you know, they don't get past Dijon. They get all they 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 were roasted in Cromani, but Dijon was balling, and right. and and I think like for a guy like you that's going to evaluate raw cover skills when there isn't a blitz, there you know, it, I mean, there's no hand, oh, no defensive line. I mean, it's maximum difficulty for a corner. There's no D line wow. pressure. There's no tip wow. balls. There's no anything. And it's like so you're just out there trying to <laughs> run with. Yeah, yeah. No, JJ. Nowhere, nowhere to hide. You know what yeah. I mean? There's nowhere to hide in seven on seven. You're just, you got it or you don't. Ball knows ball. You know what I mean? When we talk to Ricky or Brett Getz and those guys and they tell us, Dijon's a better player today. Cormani should be the much better player, you know, down the road. But for today, trying to win a seven on seven tournament, we need Dijon out there more than we need Cormani out there. Yeah. And Corbani did get beat up a lot in seven on seven last year. And to his credit, he kept coming back every week wanting more because that's the way it works for a DB. And sure. he's just so darn raw that, um, you know, when I see him going to Colorado, the, the part of it I like is that he is going to get individual attention from the GOAT. Okay. Yeah. If you can't learn from Dion, you can't learn. There's no hope for you. So, you know, the downside might be that they might be forced to play him as a true freshman and, I just hate to see the kid thrown out there before he's ready and then you lose all confidence, you know? Um, so we'll see. I, I, I like Cormani so much as a kid and, um, you know, I'm just anxious to see how he does there. And I just hope he doesn't get demolished early on. No different than Ohio state, maybe putting Luke Montgomery out there to block the Alabama defensive ends next year. Like, yeah. you know, I might not be ready for that. Luke might be, an all-american in a couple of years but he may not be ready now you know i would that would be my comparison when you put them yeah. out there too early and th- there's a chance that they can just get demolished mentally and physically and then you lose confidence and then man it's a it, it's a fight back when you lose your confidence you know as an athlete and you know how that is oh you, you have to be you, I always tell the guys, I'm like, look, you might think you stink or you might think, you're, but you got to fake it till you make it, man. Cause like, you're going to go out there and you're going to get when you, cause again, the, the hardest part, like with evaluating offensive linemen, in my opinion is, is the mental. Cause I mean, they're guys that they are world beaters in high school. They murder kids. You know, again, Connor Smith's a classic. Cause like he, I, I literally used to tell TG down. I was like, this kid's going to take your spot. I'm telling you, I, I watched him against Canton McKinley dumped right. Antoine height on his head, like jackknife power bombed him on the middle of the, the McKinley logo. And and I was like, TJ, he's way better than you. I was like, I, I just hope that he becomes my roommate. So, I, and cause I mean, I just, I was that impressed with the kid. I, mean, I thought he was going to be Alan Fanica and then shows up and he, and Connor's like one of the nicest kids you'd ever meet. Oh, but yeah. that, yeah. that, that first year, man, like, I mean, he just struggled in pass for, and they do that stupid one-on-one pass walking drill and he got murdered every day in it, like a ritual sacrifice. And it was like, I don't know if you want a single rep. And it just, I think mentally it beat him. It crushed him. And then, you know, he just, he, yeah, he wasn't like kicking people's butts all over the field like he did at Coleraine. And, and I'm telling you, like for, for college kids, like that's the thing. I, that's why 
I never get excited about any recruit until he proves he can do it in college because that you know you're going to go to Ohio State and you're that freshman corner who's five stars like some of these kids are coming in and then you got to go see Marvin Harrison Jr. in one-on-ones and he eats your lunch every single time or you got to go cover a Mecca or whoever and it's tough man and it's like these kids they're fragile and that's why I really love seven on seven because you're gonna get beat I mean if you're playing J.J. Smith and Ennis and some of these guys like you better eat your Wheaties but you're not you know unless you're Darrell Rivas, like you're gonna get beat by these guys because it's just it's designed for the offense to score and be proficient. But I don't know, it's it's always interesting. Um, something I wanted to touch on, just because it's a really hot topic, is Ohio recruiting by the Ohio State staff right now. It's something where, you know, I, I think me and you have talked at length about how the talent is down in Ohio. I think a lot of it has to do with the population shift. I think that northeastern ohio is weaker than it's been you know because you know maslin mckinley like you know that that area stark county like we used to have guys at glen oak and you know me and we had like a bunch of guys doss and kenny peterson and that area has really gone down um i i i just think that you know when you're used to get 170 guys out of the state of ohio that are d1 and now you're getting 80 or 90 maybe 100 on a great year i mean that's i mean people lie but numbers don't but what do you think of Ohio State's strategy? Because I, I get that they have to be very surgical with the offers because, you you know, like you can't pull an offer on a kid in the state of Ohio because the coaches here are like real dudes. They're not agents and handlers and whatever. Right. So, you know, you can't, you know, like the, the Danny Clark thing was a real unfortunate thing because committed early and did the deal and they, de- they stopped recruiting him. And that was a, a tough thing for a kid that, he didn't really do anything wrong. I mean, he might not have been good enough to play here, but you know, the kid committed as like a freshman. And then he was, you know, by the end of his junior year, they were moving on to Tate Martell. But what are your thoughts on the strategy Ohio state employs with uh, dealing with Ohio kids? And cause there's a lot of fringe kids. Like, you know, the kid that just committed from X from St. X to, to Michigan had an Oklahoma offer. And how does that um, kind of change the, the speed at which you got to recruit some of these kids. Cause I know as soon as they get that Michigan offer or an Alabama offer, then it's time to really evaluate a kid. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I just, I, I, w- I don't look at someone's address, you know what I mean? And I don't mm-hmm. think you can, if the ultimate goal is to win a national championship, I don't think you look at the kid's address and Ohio state has proven it can go from, coast to coast and get who they want. So I'm not going to offer an Ohio kid. Cause like you said, when you pull that offer and screw around, I don't know if they've gotten a kid from Hoban since then, you know, I mean, it's, uh-huh. it, it causes hard feelings. And then that coach also talks to other people too. And it, you got to really be careful when you do that. So I'm not going to offer an Ohio kid until I know I'm going to take that commitment, you know, and it, so it's tough, you know, and, and offering Danny Clark as a, as a freshman is a perfect example. There was no reason to offer him as a freshman. Where was he going at 15 years old? You know, he wasn't going anywhere. I don't care if he committed to anyone. You know, you're going to recruit him for the next three years anyway. So that's a great example of what can go wrong. Now, when I see them offering Bryce West or the Scott kid, it's like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I'm all in on those. But then when I see, you know, the the Armstrong twins at St. Ed's who may end up being, you know, college and NFL superstars, that to me, those kids to me, there's a line there of automatic offers. Then you got that bucket of kids that I would want to go see them in April during the spring evaluation phase. And then they're either good enough to be offered then or they're not. And I want them to come to camp in June. I may wait till they're seniors. I'm not offering until I'm ready that I know I want them in my program. I know I'm taking that offer. I'm going to take their commitment because man, I think, I think an early offer that you may have to backtrack out of can be like so devastating to where you've got to do it to the Georgia kids, the Florida kids, Texas kids, just throw a bunch of offers out there. It's fine. But boy, you recruit that Ohio kid, you better know. And when I look at those Armstrong twins, I like them. I like them a lot. They are bona fide, guaranteed, power five dudes. But 
do I know for sure that those guys will beat Bama? Because that's what I'm looking for today. I'm not comparing them as, are they the best in Ohio, which they clearly are. Are they the best tackles in America? Nobody in Texas can compete with these kids. Nobody in Florida can compete with these kids. Nobody in California, nobody at Bosco. And if, if that's how you feel, then you offer them. But, man, if you're not sure and you still, you know, then I wouldn't offer them. I would need to see more. And when I see a kid get offered in February or late January like we are now, why didn't they offer him in October? What has he done since October to earn that offer? You obviously didn't offer him when you saw him in October. You went to his games. You saw those kids play. They weren't offer kids then. Well, what has happened since October till now, January? They haven't played any more games. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, they camps. They haven't been on your campus working out. I, I, that's what makes me wonder. When I see those late January, early February offers, I'm going to know what changed. Why didn't you offer them in September or October last year when you saw them live? So that's the only questionable thing for me. And I'm just one guy's opinion. You know what I mean? Justin mm -hmm. Fry knows more than I know, and I know that. But those kids to me would be kids I would want to wait. I'd recruit the heck out of them get that relationship built, go to their school when the evaluation period starts and make my decision then. But I just don't understand these January offers to kids that you could have offered in October and you didn't when you saw them live. So, but I just think overall to answer the question, you gotta be really careful with throwing Ohio offers around. When you throw it out there, you must be prepared to take that. Or it can cause a lot of, especially at St. Ed's. You know, you don't yeah, want to take people off St. Ed's. You need to go back there year after year after year. So I just think you have to be really careful with the Ohio kids. And again, um, where are those kids going right now? And I don't care if they commit to Michigan or Georgia or whatever. You know, I'm going to keep recruiting them. So it's not like they've signed anything. So that's that's how you that's how I would balance it. I would look at Bryce West a lot differently than I look at any of the O linemen in Ohio right now. So, but it's all your board. You you formulate your board and you go after your dudes. I I think you know it, it's interesting because like the O line, it's always like one of those weird things because it's a toughie uh, now. Guys can tough. gain fifty pounds in a year. They go from two fifty to three hundred, and you know just by eating and lifting and. I went, I mean, again, just from my, my life, when I was a sophomore, I was 210. My junior year, I was 250. Then I was 265, my senior year. And it's like, I was a 265 pound guy that went to Ohio State's camp and played tackle and never passed protected my life. But I was able to move my feet, stay in front of the guys. I absolutely crushed the combine. Like I ran a 475 and I jumped, I jumped higher than Kurt Lukens on the vertical. And I never let him forget that. I had 30, 32 inch vertical. But sure, an 18 year old is good. But, you know, I was going, all the linemen I was with, Matt Mazel and Ty Hall and all these guys that were, you know, 315 pounds, 330 pounds. And then there's me, the runt. But I was skinny and wiry and I knew I'd gain weight. I knew I'd get up to about 305 ish and 310 ish and play there. But um, it, it's a tough eval. And, and I mean, I think that those camps are important. It, it's amazing how, like, the basically the one on one pass rush is kind of their Super Bowl because. If you shut guys down in that, because that, that was what I did. We used to have Ohio State Advance Camp back in the day where it was literally invite. It was the greatest thing ever. Like, it would have been a field day. I don't even know if they let the media into it. I think John McAllister was there. No, um, we were allowed into that. <laughs> that's, that's so funny. Because you guys would have loved it because it's literally all good on good. Like, it's Dante yeah. Whitner versus, you know, like Lewis here is already didn't come to that, but like David Patterson came. I mean, it was all good on good. Every guy there was a stud. That's how Hartline got his offer was at an advanced camp. Yeah. And I, he was there like three or four days, I think, and worked out every day. It wasn't like a oh. one day thing like it is now. You were there for a while. Oh, I, I went to a five day camp, five straight yeah, days Hartline at Ohio State. Did, yeah, Hartline did that too. And that, I remember that's how he got no. that offer. Yeah, he, he probably went to the three day camp, which is like they they don't even have those anymore. It's like you're you're uh 
you stay in the dorms overnight and you eat breakfast yeah. in the morning and then you go work out. Then you have lunch. Then you work out. Again. I mean, you have like basically two practices and then in the night you'd go play basketball or go swimming or do something at the rec center or something or places, you know, they used to play, uh, uh, the, um, Buckeye ball or whatever. But no, I remember seeing Brian down there at camp and I was joking with him cause I was on the team then. And he, he was a, a senior. I was like, are you ever going to leave? And he was like, I mean, he was great. Cause he was funny. And, but I mean, he wanted it. Like I mean, there's some guys that they're not yeah. going to be denied. And, and honestly, that's why, I don't turn my nose up at kids that are that don't want to come to camp, but I was I'm like, what are you scared of? You know, because I mean, if you're that bad, if you're that dude, if Brian Hartline was that dude, Brian wasn't scared of anything or anybody. Right. Like he right. he was right. like, put me against Ted Ginn at cornerback, put me against you know, because he wanted it, he wanted to go whoop him, and that's why Brian is who he is. Because like it's just like he is in recruiting now. Like when he shows up, he's coming to whoop you. He's not coming to cut a deal and be buddies, and he's coming yeah. to to break you off and. Okay, that's why I like Brian. Like Brian's always been great because he was never right. scared of anything. So, so Darren Lee did the same thing. I mean, Darren Lee came to camp, I think three or four different camps. He just kept coming back where some kids, you know, it's like, oh, I worked out. They didn't offer me the heck with them. You know, Darren was like, I'll come back tomorrow. I'll come back next week. And I'm going to show you what you need to see. And that's how he got his offer. He had, he had to come to camp several days. So right. you want it or you don't, you know, and uh, something you want bad enough is worth working for instead of being feeling rejected or your feelings are hurt or being disrespected or whatever. It was like, haven't showed you enough. I'll be back tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, it, and again, if you want to go to a place like Ohio state, the one thing that you're not allowed to have is feelings. Cause I'm telling you, like if you're a player or you're a coach or you're just remember, no matter who you are, if you're at Ohio state at some point, they're going to hate you. It doesn't matter if you're Dr Ryan Day, Urban Meyer, Jim Trestle, Woody Hayes, CJ Stroud. Like the mob will get, at one point, they will get angry and be upset with how you played, something, yeah. a play you called, whatever. So again, you got to have thick skin for it. Um, Something I, I, I've been really wanting to ask you is how do you view Michigan's aggression in recruiting in the state of Ohio? Um, and, and how does, you know, are, are they, taking the correct approach because they they're off they're going on kids you know the the robot kid who's the big tackle from eds uh they went on him brian robinson they're probably going to go on the kid from fitch yeah. Yeah. um you know how do you view that and how does that does ohio state adjust their approach at all because again you know there's levels to recruiting as you know it's like there's that mac level there's that yeah. low big 10 that illinois purdue then there's that upper big 10 wisconsin penn state then there's the peak which is Michigan, Ohio State. Um, and then, you know, like Oklahoma came in and, and they went on the kid from St. X. Like, what some of the bigger schools offer, um, how does that change Ohio State's approach? And just talk a little bit about Michigan's aggression in the state of Ohio. Well, Michigan is just probably something that I'm not qualified to speak on because I haven't gotten what they've been doing for a couple of years now and they keep winning the Big Ten and going to the playoff. <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't get it. They lose coordinators and they just go find two new coordinators that I've never heard of. And they end up as good or better than what they had before they're recruiting. They're never, they're not pulling the top one, two, three recruiting class in America. They have kids that I don't think can play and they end up, they can play. And so I'm probably not the guy to speak on that. They have a head coach that interviews for NFL jobs all the time. Um, you know, how many interviews has he had already this year? Two or three. Last year, he interviewed with the Vikings on signing day. It was the biggest <laughs> middle finger to a school I've ever seen in my life. They had cut his pay the year before. So all of this is usually a recipe to go seven and five, and you have a disaster on your hands. No, this has been, they're now the kings of the Big Ten. I don't get it. With a head coach, it seems like he doesn't want to be there. With coordinators who definitely don't want to be there, and they leave. They're recruiting kids that I think are beneath who they should be recruiting, and they don't lose games. You know what I mean? So I'm not the guy to speak on Michigan. I don't get it. And every year I keep saying this year they're going to go 7-5 and five or 8-4, and four, and they don't. So I really don't understand it, to be honest with you. It's been amazing to see. Um I tip my hat to what's going on up there, um, but I don't get it. 
I definitely don't get it. You know what I mean? So I'm not the guy to ask about how Michigan is having all this success. I wouldn't follow them. You know what I mean? Just because they're offering some of these five kids. I'm doing my own evaluations. I'm not going to be forced to do something by another school. I'm go- I think I got to do it my way, the way that I think is the right way to do things. I don't want Jim Harbaugh telling me who to offer or Nick Saban. You know what I mean? I think when, and you've sat in those rooms before, I think when you're in that recruiting room and you're going around, around the table, you got to know who you want and who you need. You know what I mean? And if you can't figure it out, and if you got to say, well, Michigan offered this kid, maybe we better, you got a problem. You have a big problem at that point that really can't be solved. You have to do your own work, do your own evaluations, and live and die with what you think. You know, if Jim Harbaugh can do your recruiting for you, then, you know, I wish you the best. So, um, and, and I still think the Ohio State way is the right way, even though they get killed every year by Michigan or they have the last two. But I still think their way is the right way. And I think you recruit from coast to coast. You go after the best. You have your board and you stay true to your board. That's the way I think Ohio State does it under Ryan Day, how they did it with Urban. I think Mark Pantone leads the way in that. And I think their way, their way is the right way. I would do it the Ohio State way. Other than the Michigan way where the coach interviews with NFL jobs all the time, the coordinators leave after they get new coordinators, they recruit under recruit who they should be recruiting and they go undefeated. So it's, I would it's, say with the Ohio state way, I really would. Yeah. It's, it's the weird, like, I mean, I, I've never been more wrong in my life than I was about Sharon Moore, their offensive line coach. He's one, the Joe Moore or the, I mean, he was a, 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 a play a coach tight ends and running backs. And, I, and I was I, like, this wasn't, this isn't Harry. He this isn't like some, you know, blue blood O-line coach, you know, dominant. I mean, he never coached O-line before. And they made him the O-line coach. I was like, that's going to be a disaster. And then he turns around and they win the Joe Moore twice. They whoop us I, twice. I mean, it was, yeah. I was, and, I was and wrong. Those, and those aren't like, those are legit awards. They've earned those awards. I mean, oh, they yeah. had, They've been a great O line two years in a row now. Yeah. Um, so, do I understand that? I do not. And that, <laughs> you know, Sharon Moore, you know, I don't get any of that. They lose Mike McDonald, the coordinator, goes back to the NFL. They lose Josh Gaddis, and they pluck two new coordinators. They don't even start the same quarterback, even though he's on the roster that led him to the playoffs last year. Start a new quarterback. <laughs> Head coach interviews every he wants out of there so bad he would take any NFL job. Nobody offers him one. I don't get it. You know, that is not a recipe to go undefeated and go to the playoffs, but they've done it two years in a row. So no, it's, I don't, it's amazing. It, it, it's it, the most amazing thing. I mean, I, I see a lot of things that, you know, if those things were going on at Ohio State, people would burn the stadium down. Oh if God! Day was interviewing on signing day. <laughs> it's like the Patriots. They, they just pick some dude to make him oh. the O line coach. And if they lose coordinators every year, and we'll just get two new guys to be court. If all that was going on and recruiting all these three stars, you know, they get kids out of Massachusetts. They, if all that was going on at Ohio State, there'd be a revolution. <laughs> it's, so I don't it's, get it. it's and unbelievable. I t- I I respect what's happened up there just because of the record. You know, yeah. the, Bill Parcell said it best, man. You are what your record says you are. Yep. And they've been the Big Ten champs and, and been to the playoffs the last two years. So, you know, you tip your hat to that. Oh, yeah. And, and they and, – and for some reason – and this is an interesting one. I'm going to ask you on this one because, you know, one of the big topics people are always wondering is – why can't we get any portal offensive linemen? So we've offered about 700 portal offensive linemen. We finally got one, the kid from Louisiana Monroe, but Michigan got like three, you know, and one is a Re- another Remington finalist. They had the guy that won the Remington came from Virginia was yeah. really good this year. And then they go out and get Stanford center. Who's probably going to learn Remington next year. What, why does Michigan, why are they able to get guys that you think we would want or need? You know, again, a Remington center with Luke Whippers walking out the door would be fantastic to add to the roster, but why, what's the difference? You know, what's, 
What's the disconnect? Like, cause that's the weird thing is like, I, I figured I'd be like, look, if I'm Justin Fry in the last two seasons, we have had four offensive lines minute declare early. Like that's never happened at Ohio state. We had three guys go this year. We had Nick Petit, Nick Petit and Thayer both started games as rookies in the NFL. I think Nick started every game for the Titans unless he got yeah. one. And yeah, Paris and Dewan are going to be starters next year in the NFL. Luke's probably going to start in the NFL, be a mid-round guy. You know, I'd be like, guys, you guys want to get developed to go to the league, especially if you're a tackle. Like, look at our tackles we've had going on to the league. You know, they started as rookies. They're ready to go. They're good. Pl- they're great players. Um, And still, like, we get, like, no, you know, like, I, I would just be, like, open for business, left and right tackle. But yeah. what what's the disconnect? Why is Michigan so successful in the portal versus yeah. us? I mean, because that's, like, the billion-dollar question. But what are your thoughts on that? You can't blame NIL because Michigan is supposed to be at the bottom of NIL. How to do it. Harbaugh's supposed to be clueless on NIL and they're just not. So you can't blame that. Uh, And again, you know, are they not promising these kids that they would start? Which I think is a very dangerous game to play with high school recruits. That's a very dangerous game. But the portal to me is different. You know, I'm not going into the portal looking for a backup. I got backups. I got a whole, I got rooms full of backups. So if I'm going after you, you're going to start and I'm going to tell you that you're going to start. You know what I mean? I know when they brought Justin Fields in, like, I know they told him, uh, you know, I don't know what they told him. To me, I would have told him, you're my dude from day one, brother. You know, lead us, lead us. When they brought, you know, the Jackson kid in from where'd he come from? Rutgers. Yes, Jonah. You know, yeah. From Rutgers, man, you're starting, dude. You're my you're my right guard day one. You're my guy. So that I mean, I think it should be obvious if if you're in the portal, you're not in the portal looking for backups. You know what I mean? So I'm telling these kids, you're my left tackle next year. I need you. You know, come to Ohio State. I want to turn you into the next Nick Pettifrere. The yeah. next there. I want you to be Dewan Jones for us. You're going to be on the field for Ohio State. Big stage. This is where you prove yourself. You know what I mean? So I don't get it. But I mean, if I'm going in the portal for a kid, I want him to know I want him to start. I'm definitely going to tell him that. I'm not going to the portal looking for backups. I got lots of them. Uh huh. How, how many of the portal tackles that they went after – do you oh. think real realistically we're like guys where you're like, that is a slam dunk high level beat Alabama or beat Georgia starter? Because like I I looked at all these guys that a yeah. lot of them play small ball. They're playing at New Mexico or wherever, like little dit UTEP and uh, you know, Massachusetts UMass or these old dinky schools and like I watched who they go against. So I was like, Well, that ain't you know, that's not Jalen Carter and and those type of dogs, but that's the thing I don't know. Is like I don't know how many of those guys were actually like really that great. I mean, there's guys that they get a lot of accolades at small schools, and that's cool. But you know, you go to the you, know, you got to go block Aiden Hutchinson or Jalen Carter. It's a different ball of wax completely. Right. But how yeah. many of the tackles in the portal do you realistically think would have been like a stamp them day one starter at Ohio State? Well, it makes you wonder, and almost tells you what Ohio State thinks of their. O line room, doesn't it? I mean, they offered everybody. They offered every tackle that had a pulse. Maybe a few that had already died. I don't know, but <laughs> that they're telling you what they think of the guys they have coming back. They weren't in the portal looking for wideouts, nope. you know, for a reason. Yeah. So why are you in the portal? They're not in the portal looking for running backs. You know, they got a million of them. They're all good. Why are you in the portal looking for? Oh, t- and you offered all of them. They offered everyone. Oh, that yeah. tells me something. That tells me a lot. So to me, it's kind of disturbing. Now, when I see him in the portal today for the freshman All-American from Ole Miss, man, I get that one. Yeah. Yeah. Sight unseen. Sight unseen. <laughs> Come on well, in. You're starting next year. I guarantee you you're starting. You know, you better tell that kid he's starting next year. And that kid knows he's going to start next year. He's not stupid. He looks at who Ohio State has. But oh, yeah. 
unless that kid has an injury I don't know about or off the field things that I don't know about, man, I'm doing all I can to get that kid. And I'm telling him he's going to be a starter. Yeah, I um, it's Davidson and B- and Bigo son in Bino, so I'm like Etienne Sabino, Bino, like yeah. it's called Bino, Bino. But I got his film rolling on the background right now. Um, for those of you on YouTube, no, I, I, I just think that you know with with the tackle room, I would imagine a couple of those guys will transfer. Some of the guys at the very bottom of the room, if they actually want to go play somewhere, because there are some guys that just flat out can't play, and and I think that every room has a couple guys that can't play at that level and. You know, and that's why we've seen guys take off. You know, we haven't seen as many guys in the O line room take off, but I think that you know something people don't talk about is the amount of attrition that we've had over the last three years on the offensive line. You know, the Harry Miller situation was terrible. Oh, um, yeah. he, was, he was a five star center that, frankly, probably would he would have started last year, or last yeah. two years probably, and instead Luke Whipler steps in. And if if Harry doesn't have his his issue or retires, like Luke Whipler would probably be like a fourth year guy with zero starts right now coming back so you know Could and, be, or they play him together and one of them moves to guard you know who knows y- but y- yeah uh, yeah the harry miller situation is you know obviously terrible for the kid you know and you just want the best for him but for ohio state that would hurt man oh yeah you don't have any five stars you know when one of them walks out the door man that's that's tough so that oh. that was out of their control no you're not blaming stud there not justin fried right it, it was just a bad situation yeah and then we had we had you know ryan jacoby portals to pittsburgh he's going to start a tackle for them max ray went to colorado he would have probably started there but he he had a medical and he never played again got hurt uh then yeah. you have nick and dewan and and pj all leave early now pj is the guy that you probably think is going to leave after three years Nick Petit, you know, you kind of figured he redshirted that first year and he's four and out, but it's just weird because, like, we're, you know, now all of a sudden, like, you know, when you think you have to, De- I mean, most people, when we took DeWan, who was a big project, you assume you'd have him for five years, you know? Right. So this year, you probably could have had DeWan play left tackle and then that line looks a whole lot better than it does now, but he got out of here and it's just, it's just been a weird run. But I, um, yeah. you know, hey, I, I, Matt Jones came back. Matt Jones could have oh, left. Fuck. Thank God he came back. I think he gets drafted if he leaves late, but I think he would have been drafted. Yeah, and I think he'll be a guy that'll be a preseason All Big Ten guy, and you know yeah. might might touch all of it. So again, I think he's the center. I think he's the guy that runs the show. I think that the Cutler kid that they bring in is probably competes to be a backup. Like I think that the first day of spring ball is probably going to be Zen, Donnie, Matt, Enoch, and then uh, Fryer at right tackle. And then they just kind of rotate guys in and out. I think that we just need. Yeah, I think Justin's biggest thing um, was yeah, we need more competition at some of those spots, at the tackle yeah. spots especially. And again, like when you've got these guys that are three and out, like that's – it's a good and bad thing. It's like taking one and duns in Kentucky basketball. I mean, yeah. You, yeah. you know what it is. When you get Paris Johnson, like you're not going to say, well, we'll redshirt that kid and let him sit for a year. And now he's – he's uh, he was on a plan to graduate in three years, be an All-American, be a first-round pick, and he's going to hit all three. So yeah. I am yeah. um, – I think it's it's uh it's fascinating. Do you um, the, you know this is an interesting question. So uh, RJ, I always I, I talk about this a lot. He says, you know, in the Midwest, just because of the dearth of talent versus the South, um, you know, how much does it affect Ohio State just being up here? Where there's just we're just it's not as talent rich as it used to be. Again, I go back to the O two class, which you know it seems like dinosaurs was twenty years ago, but. That class, you have Maurice Claret, Mike DeAndre, Nick Mangold, AJ Hawk, Bobby Carpenter, Troy Smith, Justin Zwick, like Quinn Pitcock, Nick Mangold. I mean, all Ohio kids, literally. Yeah. And yeah. and and I mean, you could win a national championship with a class like that, but you can't take that. You don't have. I mean, not only were those guys in state, but those were like very high level guys. They might not have had the highest recruiting rankings, but by the time their careers were over, they were. First round picks, all Americans, Heisman winners. Yeah. You know, obviously, Maurice Claret's the best set. You know, if he had gone three years, he probably would have won the, re- the the Heisman if he stayed three years at Ohio State and did his thing that next year. But how much, you know, how much is it that we're just not in the state of Georgia? It's huge. Yeah. I mean, it's huge, no doubt. And I agree with that question 1000%. I mean, when you look at where does Alabama and Georgia have to go to get their guys? They don't have to go far. 
here in Ohio, you know, you can't do it with Ohio kids like you used to. And just the raw numbers that you laid out spell it all. You're now in a state that produces 80 to 90 D1 kids, which is good. How many of those are MAC kids? A high percentage. You're not producing 170 kids anymore. You know what I mean? I, there was a day when I would drive from my house not far to Maslin and look at their seven D1 kids, then shoot over to Camp McKinley and see their seven or eight D1 kids. Go to Glen Oak and see their two or three D1 kids. Those kids are all gone now. They're gone. They're not around. St. Ed's, when I would take a trip to Cleveland and look at St. Ed's, it's 10 D1 kids. Glenville's 10 D1 kids. This is spread out over three classes. Um, Chuck Kyle would have his 10 D1 kids. Those kids aren't around anymore. I was that's, that's 50 kids probably in a small radius from Canton to Cleveland. There's not five anymore. It's crazy. Maybe 10 at the most. So, yeah, of course they have a huge advantage in the South. And, and that's why they win all the titles. You know, you, how many have they won? If you look in the last 20, it's yeah. it's staggering. Um, it's the teens, you know what I mean? And then when they don't get them, like the SEC doesn't get them, well, Clemson gets a couple. Yep. And Clemson's an SEC team to me. Yep. You know what I mean? It's not. They're certainly not a Northern team. Nope. So, yeah, of course, it's you know it's a great point that, that RJ brought up. I agree with him a thousand percent. It's harder at Ohio State. It's definitely harder. And um, that's what you're dealing with. So... Shut up and go to work. Nobody wants to hear it, but it's no. a great point. <laughs> no, it's they, great they point. don't. But, you know, it's a great point, and I agree with that a thousand percent. You know, um, I see the seven-on-seven seven team that Brett and Ricky put together. How does they would take all those kids? This is just a seven-on-seven seven team made up of, you know, Dade and Broward County. How does they mm. take all those kids? A couple Ooh, years ago, yeah. you know, Bama had that great defensive backfield that won a national title with Sertain and Daniel Wright. Uh, ba- battle. Battle. Yeah. Those, all three of those kids played on the same seven-on-seven team. They were Brett's kids on the same seven-on-seven team. And they are a national championship defensive backfield. Whew. So, you know, it, it, it's it's a thousand times harder. You know what I mean? It's yeah. It's... Nothing and, great and, in here, and, and I, I don't have the answer to that one from David Greenshield. I don't have that answer. I I can only I can't tell you why. I can tell you that, you know, the numbers say that Ohio State had what ninety D one kids this year. Yeah, 80, 80 or ninety, and yeah, it used it like to be 60, 170. I can tell you just the raw numbers that th- the talent isn't here anymore. Why? I don't know. Where have they gone? <laughs> I don't know. They're just not around anymore. And, and and Ohio is a heavily populated state. Where are they at? You know, I, I don't know. Other other people have them. You know what I mean? So you can't say, it's, well, football's down. Moms aren't letting their kids play football. That's across the country. That's not just an Ohio thing. So where where are the D1 kids, the Ohio state level kids? I don't know. I don't know. Do do you but, think OSHA's insistence on not having any type of spring football hurts. hinders our development and hinders our ability to get recruited up here? I do. I think you have to use everything, everything at your disposal, because those kids are using everything at their disposal. All the top kids are playing seven on seven. Florida has spring football. I've been down there to spring football. It's amazing what they do. I've covered it before for scout.com. Um, so you've got to use everything at your disposal. Why are you, why are you having your kids compete with one hand tied behind their back when Florida and Georgia aren't, you know what I mean? So I think you have to use everything at your disposal. I don't think in Ohio, I don't think we're being fair to our kids. Okay. And a lot of it are the coaches. The coaches are scared to death of having that AAU mentality in high school football. They're scared they're going to lose their kids to another program. Well, who are you looking out for there? The coach looking out for his record and his job, or are we looking out for our kids? Who are we doing right by? Are we doing right by our coaches, or are we going to do right by our kids? 
Do we want our kids to get college scholarships and be all they can be? Or are we worried about some coach losing a superstar wide receiver? To me, I'm always for the kids. Okay, so that's where I land. I think everything should be done to make our kids better and increase their opportunities. I'm all for that. I hate seeing us have 90 D1 kids when 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we had 170. Those are 80 kids that aren't going to school for free anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So are and, we, do we really care about the kids? Is that what we really care about? Those numbers right there should be scary enough to people to insist that we have seven on seven and we have we have spring football. Because we now have 60, 70, 80 kids that were going to college for free. Where are those kids at now? Where are they going? They're not going to college for free. I don't have that answer. They're, 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 honestly, a lot of them probably a lot of them probably aren't going to college. I'd rather see them in college, getting college degrees. That's what I wanted for my two kids, and they have them. So I want that for everybody's kids. So yeah, that's that's a. Uh, I mean, you write a book on this. You really oh, I, could. I, well, I, I, my my thing with like the AAU thing that you bring up, because again, it's a good point, and I think it's kind of like seeing a ghost. But why hasn't it destroyed basketball and baseball? Because baseball, there's travel baseball all summer, and AAU basketball is all summer. So what's the difference if a kid picks AAU football, essentially? Yeah, I, I just think the high school coaches are scared to death of yeah, seeing their kids playing with other kids from other schools. And, well, that's life. You know, we're right. Maslin Perry guys. Where have I got? Where have our guys gone for the last <laughs> 30 years or, or more? They go up the road. Yeah, of course. I mean, they're, they're going to go, like, again, like Devin Jordan, who was in my class, didn't want to sure. be a wing T quarterback. So he went to Maslin and, and honestly, I was angry with him about it. I still give him crap about it, but Hey, he became a division one Ohio state football wide receiver full yeah. ride scholarship. So did he better himself? Absolutely. You know, that's so I can't be mad about that yeah, when a guy it, wants to. Yeah. But to me, that kid ended up with a college scholarship. Did he play yeah. at the high school I root for? No. Do I care about that? No. I want to see these kids get college educated, go on to do great things in their lives. So when we see 170 kids used to get D1 scholarships, and now we're we're seeing 90 from our state get them, and 80 kids a year, I don't know where those kids are, you know, what's happening to the rest of their lives because of that. To me, it's scary. It's scary. Oh. And that means our Maslin Perry team loses some kids. Oh, well. Oh, well, I want to see college. I want to see kids become college educated and do well. And when I see those number, the numbers drop like that in our state, to me, that's alarming and it's scary. And I don't think it's right. And I think we should look at this to give these kids every single opportunity to make themselves the best they can be. And when we don't have seven on seven and we don't have spring football, I don't think we're doing right by our kids. I I literally couldn't agree more about anything you said. Cause it's, I'm telling you like the seven on seven, it, I think it's, you know, again, I think it, you know, with, like yeah. what Brett does with the organization and it gets kids exposure to recruiting analysts like yourself, where they can say, Hey, this kid's the guy. Hey, you know, it's like, I know these analysts obviously talk to college coaches. Hey, you should offer yeah. this guy. You know, it, it, it's just like a no brainer. It's like one of those things where, you know, and, and then you do spring practice, like division three college football, like Mount union level football they do two weeks with no pads. And I think that would still be better than nothing. Cause at least you can install plays, run around, catch the ball, work on blocking you know, bags and that kind of thing. And yeah. you can install your offense in the spring. At least that would get the guy, the kids to be in helmets and, I, and be I able to. Do, I, whatever they're doing in Florida and Georgia, California, that's what we need to do in Ohio. Okay. Why yeah. should our kids be at a disadvantage? Why are they not getting everything that, other states are getting why there's no there's no good answer we're not doing everything that we can do to help our kids be the best they can be and to me that's that's wrong i and i told I, 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 my son-in-law coaches at Maslin perry i'm sure you, you know oh i know ethan oh well man oh well i mean i want the kids to become the best they can be and if that means 
they hang out with kids from other schools and they go transfer to that school. Oh, well, make your program better. They'll want to stay. They'll want to come to your school. Yeah. So exactly. that, or yeah. I'm glad that guy brought that up. I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. And it's something that has bothered me for, for years. Only when you look at the numbers, when you look at the raw numbers, then it, it, it kind of hits you in the face. Oh yeah. Like that's where you're just like, I'm mean, literally it's half it's, it's 50% fear. So, so that means that you every know, year, all, dude, every yeah. year compound that over three, four, five years, you're talking a couple hundred kids that are not getting D one offers right now. And I, I don't think we're doing everything we can to help them. So I, I, I totally agree. Uh, Ted Hammond committed to Michigan, the St. X kid I was talking about. Um, I don't know if you've seen him at all. I thought he'd de- de-tackle from St. X. Yeah I, yeah, I watched his film, and I thought he'd be a good offensive tackle, but do you think he was worthy of an Ohio State offer? I mean, obviously committed to Michigan tonight, but I, I didn't see, like, anything where, that was mine. He would be a camp crazy. kid. He'd be a camp kid for me. You know, get your butt to camp. I want to see you work out. And And maybe he does do that. You know what I mean? He's committed to Michigan now, but what's to say we we won't see him in camp in Ohio State in June? Um, so would I offer him now? I would not. Based on the film I saw, no. No. Do I think he's better than our, the whole detackle board from Texas, California, Florida, Georgia, Alabama? No, I don't think he is. I, but I'd sure like to see him in camp. Come show me. Show me yeah. what you got. And, you know, you're back up on the screen again that Ohio coaches say that hurts spring sports. Are we worried more about the kids or are we worried about the coaches' baseball team? It will hurt spring sports. But the kid doesn't – the kid – let the kid make the choice. Let the kid decide, I want to be a great football player, so I'm not going to play baseball this year. Yeah, that might hurt spring sports. Oh, well. I mean, somebody else gets to play on the baseball team that would have got cut. I, I, just, I my, my focus is always on the kids, not on, not on teams records or coaches, individual records. I'm always about the kids doing well. Let the kids make that choice with their parents. And if a kid gives up baseball to concentrate on football all spring, oh, well, that means somebody else is going to make the baseball team that would have got cut. That's so. That is the perfect because again, you look at high level sports, you know, like like for instance, in in hockey, you know, a lot of kids go away to to play junior hockey at 16 years old. And they're living with a billet family, which is like a, a family that basically you know they live with. And you know, they, they're literally are 16, 17, 18 year olds that play, you know, 80 games of 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 big time hockey before you know they get drafted into the NHL. And Somehow their schools that literally lose them because they go and play junior hockey, um, they survive somehow, you know? Yeah. And so th- those kids, like their, their baseball team somehow still survive. And like you look at Ennis and Malachi, Tony, and some of these guys, they don't play basketball. They don't play baseball. They, they might run track. I'm not sure, but they're football. And these, the way these well, kids, a lot, us- do, a lot of them do run track and yep. the, the coaches work it out. You know what I mean? You work it out to where the kid can go through football practice, but he's maybe he misses a football practice on Wednesday because he's got a baseball game. And yeah. the coach work it out for the best of the kid. What are we concerned about are we, as a coach? Am I concerned about going, you know, 20 and five in baseball as opposed to going, you know, losing three more games? Or do we care about our kids? Do we want our kids? to be the best and they still run track those guys all run track and they go through spring football you work it out the coaches work it out you know hey i get we got a game tonight let johnny skip football practice today you get him back tomorrow sure that's fine coaches work together for the best of the kid yeah i i totally agree like like i said i think uh you know like like a lot of these sports like if you're a gymnast or a baseball player or a basketball player. It seems like every single sport in Ohio, except for football has like an AAU travel element. And 
and yeah. it, it, it it absorbs so, like so much like if you're a high level swimmer like you can't really go play basketball and track I mean because you're in the pool I mean it's just whatever sport you want to be really good at you got to dedicate a lot of time and resources to it and I feel like again you know we're gonna make you know, I know Bill's like I don't want to be the president of OSHA but I wish you were because you'd probably have spring football done by tomorrow but I just think that it's you know it's just so important that they they do that because it just we're falling behind in a big way. And like you said, these, these college coaches, they love to go down to Florida and Georgia and go watch, you know, these scrimmages, scrimmages, and they get to see guys in pads actually practice. And, yeah. uh, and in Ohio, yeah. you can watch them run track and, and play center field. Yeah. So and, there's an advantage there. I mean, when you look at a high school kid in Florida and you take his four years of high school, all the extra practices he gets, I mean, that's a lot of extra football he's playing because you can't play football like you can become a better basketball player in your in your driveway. You can yep. become a better shooter. You know what I mean? There's a lot of other sports you can football, man. You can't strap it up and find 21 other dudes. No, you can't. So look at all those extra practices that those kids get over the course of four years. Oh, they play it, they school play a spring game. You know what I mean? And, and, and so he gets four spring games, all those practices. It has to make you better. Oh, it, 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 it has to it, make you better. There's no doubt. Like football's, you know, especially like in the trenches, like offensive D-line, you know, you can go out and catch balls from a jugs machine or have your quarterback three balls, but O-line D-line like in to get padded work done against yeah. each other. You can't like I can't say, hey Bill, meet me in the park and bring your shoulder pads right. and helmet. Let's go. You'd be like, screw you, dude. I'm I'm not gonna get ran into by you. But like, you know, that would only be one on one work anyway. This is team on team. Yeah. You know, oh, you're yeah. playing you're playing football, real live football. Yeah. I mean, it has to make them better. The course of all the extra football those kids get to play. In Florida, Georgia, California. I mean, it has to make a difference. And it does make a difference. Yeah. And then you inject seven on seven on top of it. And it's like, it's like, it's like you get like triple the skill development when you live in one of those states. Let's give our kids every advantage. And if they don't want to play baseball, that's, that's their family choice. They've made that decision with their family and that's their choice. And if they want to play both, then the coaches work it out. You know, there are kids that run track and play baseball, and the coaches just work it out together. You could do the same thing with spring football. And spring football doesn't last the whole spring. You're only talking what, two or three weeks, I think. Yeah, so. and, 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 and you know, I look at, like, your guy from McKinley who went to IMG, and I look at, like, Carnell Tate who went to IMG. Yeah, they went there at a young age, business decision. It's hard. They left home, but – they were all football all the time, 365 days a year, and and they end up going to LSU and, and Ohio State. And, like, I just look at that model, and I think that that's the most successful model because you're completely immersed in the sport that you want to be yeah. great at. Right. You know, they, they, there ain't no dodging, no spring ball or any of that. And, I mean, that's, you know, the, the kid from McKinley that went down there, like, I mean, it stinks for McKinley because they lose a, an SEC-level right. tackle. Right. But, you know, I mean, that kid – probably developed more by going down there and you know, yeah at, clearly the best for him and yeah it did hurt canton mckinley oh well it let some other kids start that wouldn't have started that's the way yeah. i look at it i mean i i don't care about the high school's records i don't care i care about these kids having every advantage to pursue their dream and you know i'm not even talking about NFL. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about because very small percentage do that. I'm talking about becoming college educated for free. Yeah. There are 50, 60, 70 less kids a year going to college from Ohio for free. That's it, scary to me. That's staggering. They're, they're not be, and, and maybe they can pay for college or maybe they take loans out or maybe they just don't go. And then well, we're losing we're losing college educated people and I see nothing better than having our young people become college educated. Again, you beat a dead horse all night on this, but 
what I wanted for my kids when they were a very young age, I wanted them to become college educated. And they are. And I've seen the benefit of that. It's an amazing thing. Neither of my kids are in any professional sport, but they have college degrees and they're, you know, have great jobs today because of it. And what I want yeah. for my kids, what I want for your kid and everybody else's kids. I, I, absolutely. And, and, and the thing that you, you haven't touched on that's also really true is a lot of these kids, if we're being brutally honest, they wouldn't get into a college on just merit. A lot of these guys, they need that, that exception that they get through being athletes. You know, like, I mean, we would write, you know, for guys that were, you know, Ohio State, their, their baseline, uh, you know, average ACT score for the freshman class is like 33 and a perfect wow. is a 36. Wow. So I wow. got a 26. So if Kirk that- Martin shows up with a 3.5 GPA and a, a 26 on the ACT, Ohio State isn't going to even look at me. You know, but if you're an athlete, they can get you in. So, and that's across the board at every college. Like there's guys that get into college that would never get into Michigan or Penn State or Akron or Kent or wherever. So where does that leave them? Out on the street, hanging around, doing nothing, whatever, as opposed to, you know, progressing through life and grinding towards a college degree, which is tough. But once you're done with it, man, and you got a degree way easier to go out and find a job doing something in, in, in the world when you can say, yeah, I graduated from Ohio state or Michigan or Penn state or whatever. So, um, but yeah, that's the thing that I, it's really unfortunate. It's really, honestly, it's sad to me. Is that there's, like you said, there's 80 kids that even if they had the money, they still might not get into a college because they might not have the grades. They might not have yeah. the, the, the yank that you get when you're a college kid. If you're a college football player, they can get you in. Yeah, you know, there's college football players that get into Stanford that would never get into Stanford or Duke yeah, or yeah. Harvard or whatever. So, yeah, that's part of the gig. But yeah, you wonder where those kids end up, and and like you said, it's a it's a sad deal. Well, Bank, I appreciate this. This has been an excellent show. Um, again, I love when you get back from these seven on seven events because those things are always a blast to hear about. Um, yeah, we're gonna go check sure. one out, and uh, you know, I, I again, I just appreciate everything uh, any final parting thoughts uh we're getting into winter conditioning spring ball opens on march That's 7th so, what would you march say is six weeks away man so yeah and, and uh, this year i think spring ball takes on a little added bit of juice because there's going to be so much competition all over the place mainly you know the quarterback spot is going to be uh, off the chart and then you're going to want to see how things are progressing on that O line. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, th- those are huge question marks this year. <laughs> I mean, you know, and then even the, yeah. you know, the defensive backfield, what's going on there? What's happening on that D line? You know, the only places that are really set are wide receiver, running back, linebacker. Other than that, man, there's position battles all over the place. And those are going to be so much fun you know, to track day after day. Oh, I, I'm telling you, that's the best part about spring because you know, there's going to be guys, you know, everybody wants to play, man, but now it's time to play. Now you're yeah. you're yeah. the guy. You're not watching Paris Johnson doing it anymore, Zen. You got to get in there and go do it now. And you got to do it at Paris's level or something close because now we're counting on you. So that's always uh, the interesting part about spring. And again, like I, you know, I, I'm higher on the line just because I, I really know Justin Fry really well. I know he's going to do a good job, but yeah, the last time I, people were this nervous about an O-line was 2014. I wish I could have had an interview with you then and said, Bank, we're starting Daryl Baldwin at right tackle, Jacoby yeah. at center. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I couldn't imagine your days. I'd be like, how much are you going to bet on us winning the national championship, Bank? We got Jacoby and Daryl Baldwin starting. You'd have been like, yeah, I think I'll no short way. that one. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that was, uh, you never know. That's why, you, you know, <laughs> we tune in in the spring and we want to see who's who's taking that next step who's who's better than what they were last year you know so it'll be fun it'll be fun to track this year because you don't have all these guaranteed starters you know that they've had in the past so it'll be fun i can't wait anytime there's a quarterback battle it's always fun because that's the one that everybody that's the that's who wants the golden ticket to be the next first round quarterback at ohio state because we're churning them out right now and Whoever gets that spot, man, we've had the all Big Ten quarterback for 11 straight years. Since 2012, every single year we've had the first team all Big Ten quarterback. Braxton, 
JT, <laughs> uh, Justin Fields, Dwayne Haskins. I mean, yeah. every single year. So, I mean, that's like whoever wins this battle is like, oh boy, I, yeah, I get to throw the Marvin and Emeka and Cade Stover yeah. and Trey Henderson and Mayan and oh my God. So, you know, they'll, I think they'll be able to muck it up up front. And, you know, with that kind of skill, it's like you don't have to hold the ball long because Marvin will get open quick. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you, Bank, as always. Thank you, brother. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Uh, thank you, my man. Uh, what a great show. Fantastic. Bank's passionate about spring football. I can't agree more. These kids need the skill development. I think the coaches, it helped the coaches as much as the players because they get you know to install their offense and defense uh, at a more relaxed pace. Even if they did it without pads, I think it would be good. You know, They, ha- they can't have the camp days in the summer, but get it done, OSHA. Um, we are talking Ohio State football. We're tracking these uh, the huge portal news. Uh, first team All American, or excuse me, a, a freshman first team All American corner coming to visit Ohio State is going to be fantastic. It'll all be on BuckeyeScoop.com. Uh, I don't know. If, I, I'm tracking the Laurinaitis stuff. You know, that's my guy. I hope that he uh, he gets in here. Not sure if he will. Um, but there's a lot of stuff. You know, they got to fill back fill the support staff that's been raided by not raided, but you know, a bunch of these guys took jobs with Kevin Wilson, which is great for them. Uh, to be full-time coaches now. So it's going to be really good. I'm excited about it all. And we are on BuckeyeScript.com nonstop. Uh, If you guys could, on your way out, leave us a like, comment. Should Ohio have spring football? Yes or no? Write it in the comments. Appreciate you guys. As always, join BuckeyeScript.com. Our community is out of this world. The bank had a chat today that was massive. Very entertaining stuff. Very fun stuff. Uh, Doing it the way only bank can. And, uh, the community is awesome. So we appreciate you guys. As always, thank you so much, Scoop family. And thank you, Buckeye Nation. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Go Bucks.